Awesome. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to another Product School Talk. Um, we have a very special guest with us today. I know you guys got um, to see him for just a second. So um, before we begin, I just want to make sure that everybody can see and hear me now. Um, you can go ahead and type book in the comments and um, you'll get a free copy of the product book. Um, let's see, and uh, yeah, so as many of you know, uh, we teach product management, coding, data, and now blockchain at our 14 campuses um, all over the world. And um, our guest today is Valentin Aseo. He is, he was a former product manager over at Facebook and he is actually a product manager at Bands in Town uh, currently. So. Uh, Valentin, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you? <laughs> Wonderful. Um, here, we can go ahead and turn on your video as well so everybody can see you. Sure. I am not able to turn my video. I think you got the control over it. Okay, let's see. Here. Okay. So it should be working now. Um, awesome. Hi, Valentin. Welcome. Hey. Um, great to have you today. Thank you so much. I'm very excited. Um, if you could take a second um, before you begin your presentation um, and tell everybody a little bit more about your background and how you got started in product management. Yeah, totally. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Valentine. I'm the SVP of product at Benz in Town. Um, and so, okay, a little bit about me. For those of you who are not familiar with Bands in Town, it is the number one concert discovery app. And based on your music taste, we curate a list of live music events like um, DJ gigs, festivals, um, concerts. Definitely download the app. Before Bands in Town, I spent close to um, eight years working at Facebook in Ireland, India, and the US spinning many different roles. And prior to that, I was at Colgate, Palmolive, and IBM. Awesome, thank you. Um, well, I'll give you a couple um, seconds too to get uh, your screen sharing set up. And, um, and then for those of you out there, if we have a few moments after his presentation, we'll go ahead and take a couple of questions. Um, yeah, I'll definitely make sure that um, I have some time for questions. Okay, great. Okay. Can you guys see my screen? Uh, yes, we can. It looks great. Um, I'll let you take it from here. Awesome. Cool. Okay, just a second. Okay. There we go. Cool. Hi, everyone. Um, do you remember a time that you totally nailed it at an interview? or um, maybe another time that things didn't go so well? Were you able to figure out why you got different results at all? Interviewing for a job is never a piece of cake. It takes a lot of courage, spectacular communication skills, and extensive prep. And honestly, sometimes stars need to align and you need to wear your lucky underwear. Because, I mean, I get it, it's a tough job. When I had my first interview um, about like 15 years ago, I wish someone gave me these golden rules that took me a decade to learn. If you follow them religiously, I guarantee you, you can get the job of your dreams and then you can thank me for it. Today, I'll talk about how to crack the product manager interview. Um, so as I mentioned before, I am the SVP of product at Benz in town and before that I was at um, Facebook for eight years. So um, I, um, got my fair share in this product domain. And throughout my career, I interviewed roughly, probably more than 2,000 people. And every so often, I witness a stellar candidate do so poorly in the interview, just because they don't follow these essential rules. So um, what are they? Let's take a look. Number one, focus on impact. As you talk about your work experience, it's key to quantify the impact of your past accomplishments. Talk about the success metrics and KPIs. How many people used your product and services? How many stars did you get on the App Store? Or how much revenue did you bring? How did it change people's lives? Follow the same rule when you work on your resume. 
When you say, okay, I streamlined the review process for incoming tickets. This doesn't tell me much if you don't mention the impact. But if you change it and you tell me you automated 30% of the incoming tickets, saving 10 hours a day, then you actually tell a different story. Your resume should speak to the impact of your projects. Otherwise, the project description alone won't be convincing. And it's same for the interview. Always follow up with the impact of your actions or suggestions. The second situation where impact will come into play is prioritization. When you respond to prioritization questions such as product roadmap and resource allocation, always focus on the impact on the key metrics. Number two, solve the problem solving problems. The interviewers, interviewers are interested in knowing how you tackle daily problems and how you would improve the product. They try to probe into the creativity, scalability, um, measurability, and feasibility of your answers by asking problem solving, also known as critical thinking questions. They may ask you something totally out of your comfort zone, like, okay, design a parking lot. And, and they will catch you off guard. And if that happens, here are a couple of steps. First, take a few seconds to gather your thoughts. Never jump the gun and try to answer the question right away. Like pause, compose your thoughts. It's totally fair to take a moment before you answer these questions or any type of questions for that matter. The second step is clarify the context if needed. Like ask for clarifications. What are they trying to accomplish? What is the request? Oftentimes interviewers make the mistake of thinking that they understand the questions and they give the right wrong answer just because they actually don't get the question. And um, the second step, I'm sorry, the third step is agree on the goals and set boundaries because like designing a parking lot, it's, it's a huge question. Like what are the boundaries? What neighborhood? What goal am I accomplishing? So narrowing down the scope of the question will actually help you with the problem solving prob uh, questions. Okay, here's the most important part. And if there's one single thing you get out of this webinar today, it should be this. So turn up the volume. When you're asked to, to offer innovation, think about the big solutions. How will your ideas move the needle? I'll give you guys a couple of examples. I used to ask candidates um, to tell me something to fix on our platform. And then I would get answers like, yeah, like you guys should fix your filtering options. It doesn't really work as intended. It's like, it's not, it's not working. And I'm like, cool, that, that's a good idea, but how, how will this impact the product? Will, will it really change the engagement? Like, will it really increase the engagement by 30%? So I'm asking about big things. So now I actually changed my um, question and I ask, tell me the number one thing to fix on our platform, which means we're going to stop, drop everything that we're doing right this moment and we'll tackle this issue because it's really getting in the way of user engagement. So think big. The second example is I would ask for an idea, you know, product idea to build on our platform. And I would get some answers, but never the really great one. So now I changed the question to tell me your million dollar product idea to build on our platform. Tell me something that I've never heard before and I didn't think about it and our competitors are not doing. Tell me something very unique because I will not settle, that, settle for anything less than a million dollar worth of an idea. I know you guys probably got the um, point, but I'll give you guys a third example. I would ask for strategies to increase the engagement on our platform, right? Like how do we increase the monthly active users? And I would get some answers. And I'm sure most of them would help, but not big enough. So now I ask for strategies that we can use to double, triple, quadruple the monthly active users in a week. I know it sounds exaggerated, and it is, but it will completely change your thought process because you're not going to give me any answer. 
you're going to pause, go back to your Rolodex of all the ideas that you gather and pick the one that will really make the biggest impact. So now keep in mind that I've been interviewing for a decade, so I know my game. But you may find yourself in an interview that's not in, as inspiring, and the interviewer may not phrase these questions like this. And if that happens, I want my voice to echo in your head and think about big, exaggerate the problem, exaggerate the question, and give them like your best idea and pretend the format of the question is that they're asking you a million dollar idea. And this is how you solve the problem solving problems. Number three, to be or not to be analytical. The interviewers want to see if you're data oriented. They may give you a couple of different scenarios or um, maybe ask for an estimation question. For example, how many people are sleeping in the world right now? You pause and you're like, I have absolutely no clue. Of course you don't, how would you? But I'll give you a secret. The answer doesn't matter. In fact, nobody knows the actual answer. Plus, there isn't one single answer. I mean, it changes depending on the time of the day, right? But here's how you answer these questions. You talk about your thought process as you get to your actual answer. Because the interviewers want to hear your approach. Are you able to break down this problem? So let's take this one as an example. How many people are there in the world that's sleeping right now? Step one, feel free to make assumptions. Otherwise, you'll never be able to fix it. Average person sleeps eight hours. That's my assumption. Cool. I'm not sure if that's the real st statistics. Maybe they sleep seven, maybe five. But it doesn't matter as long as you make this assumption that you're going to use for the rest of the problem solving process, you're good. And then you can even say, OK, my assumption is that these eight hours are from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. Step two, then use some lo logic. Um, OK, so what time is it here? It's almost 3 p.m. here in New York. I'm based in New York. It's almost 3 p.m. here. So you're like, OK, I'm going to add seven hours to get to 10 p.m. when people start to um, go to sleep. Step three is use some knowledge. Um, so you're like, OK, seven hours from New York probably takes me to Middle East, where people are going to bed. And the next step is um, you use some more logic. You're like, OK, people will be sleeping for eight hours. So when you add eight more hours to Middle East, from Middle East, you will probably go to New Zealand on the map, right? Before people actually start waking up. So basically, you found out that everyone in the Middle East, Asia, Far East, and Australia, all that region is sleeping this moment. And then you can use some knowledge and be like, OK, world population, what's the population? like? What's the estimated population of Asia or um, Middle East or Australia? And then you can just tell them, OK, my estimation is 2.5 billion. It doesn't matter if you're right or wrong, but you actually covered, like, the worst case scenario, you can pull up Google and check out the populations of those regions and get find the right answer. Or there's another way of solving these problems as well, which will actually speak to your personality and efficiency, which is just use shortcuts. You made the assumption and you said, OK, average person sleeps eight hours a day. You're like, there are 24 time zones. So eight divided by 24. So you're like, OK, one third of the time zones will be sleeping at all times, which makes sense. OK. The world population is 7.5 billion people. So I'll take one third of it, which makes 2.5 billion. Like it's, I'm, I, I'm not sure if I went too fast, but I just want you guys to see the framework of it. Just you think that you make assumptions and then you use your logic and then you think out loud so that they get a chance to um, understand your thought process. Number four, once upon a time. And there comes the situational questions to cover your soft skills like 
leadership, communication, and teamwork. For example, tell me about a time you led a team or tell me about the time you had a disagreement with your peer. Tell me about a time you managed a cross-functional project. And the examples may be multiplied. Okay, so here's how to answer these questions. And there's only one way to prep for these questions, and that's to practice, pretty much like anything in life. You need to flex this muscle in your brain. You can't have a perfect beach body without working out. So for these questions, you need to practice too. Go to an online resource like Glassdoor or Google the top 100 um, interviewing questions for like situational behavioral questions and grab 10 of them every night and practice 10 every night before bed. This way, over time, you will build an, an entire archive of answers to these situational questions. And the key is you have to speak from experience and you need to give examples. Never make up any stories because I guarantee you, you will get caught. One interviewer will pause you, double click on that answer and will want to probe into it a little bit more and ask you specific questions and you will, you will pause. And keep in mind that your facial expression will change as well. There is always a difference in your facial expression when you're trying to remember something and when you're trying to come up with something. So always be honest and speak from your examples by giving genuine, um, genuine examples. So then um, I'll get some questions at the end, but the number one question I always get at this stage here is, um, they go, Valentine, I get it, but what if I don't have the answer? What if I don't have the experience needed for that question? My answer is simple. Think twice because you actually do. Let me give you an example. The question is, tell me about a time you led a team. Well, maybe in reality, you didn't lead a team and that's fair. But what about that time that you were the team leader for that college project? What about a time that you, you were head of all the volunteers during your whatever volunteering activity and you had to coordinate all the volunteers? Or what about that time that you were in charge of all the new hire orientation and training and um, you mentored all these new hires, even though you didn't officially manage them, but you mentored them and you were in charge of their scheduling, their productivity. So these are all um, experiences that translate to that question. And it's, re it's pretty relative. So if you may not have the exact experience that they're looking for or exact situation, but you will always find something similar that will be convincing enough. Okay, last but not least, curiosity feeds the cat. So at this stage, end of the interview, you think you did a great job and you're ready to end the interview, right? Not quite yet. The questions you ask at the end of the interview may make it or break it. So brainstorm a variety of questions in advance to show your interest and curiosity. Definitely refrain from asking questions that can be Googled to get answers because that will really not work and make you look bad. And the questions you ask will actually reflect your intelligence and critical thinking and investment in this process. I'll give you guys an anecdote um, to prove that these questions are the single-handedly most crucial thing that will change the decision of the interviewer. So every now and then, I, I mean, I find myself in a great interview. Everything is going great. I love the candidate and I'm actually like ready to extend an offer right there and that in the middle of the interview. But I wait and at the end I ask, okay, so do you have any questions for me? And the question I get is, so can I work from home? And I'm like shocked. Like, is this really the most important thing that you want to know right now? Because you have some FaceTime with me right now, so you better ask me a good question. Like, maybe this may, this may actually be 
a pet peeve for me as well. Like when I was on dating apps and the first question I got was, how old are you? But that would drive me nuts because first of all, the right question is how young are you? I'm not that old, thank you. But seriously, like my age is the most important thing to you. Like same with the interview. What is like your questions will show the most important thing for you to learn. The opposite anecdote is also um, true and pretty common. I would be in an interview that I'm not really engaged. My decision is no hire for that interview, but I wait and I ask, do you have any questions for me? And then I get a question that blows my mind. And I'm like, wow, where did that question come from? And I pause and I'd be like, actually, what do you think about it? And then we find ourselves in a great engaging conversation. I get another amazing question. I'm like, boom, completely shocked, which changes my entire decision on the interview. Because I know that when I go to an interview, I have a list of questions. I ask them hundred times. So I am prepared for that interview, but you're not. So I'm catching you off guard. So if you don't give me the best question, best answers to my questions, I may try to understand but you have absolutely no excuse for not asking good questions. Like, feel free to write them down and have it in a folder, have it in front of you. And when the interviewer asks, do you have any questions for me? This is how you respond. Actually, I'm glad you asked. I gathered some questions that are really important for me to ask. And you open your folder. I'm like, let me, um, let me pick one for you. Like, no one's gonna judge you for referring to your notes that you put in advance, which actually shows prep and due diligence, and you will never be um, judged. Open that notebook, open that folder, bring out your questions and ask me your best question. Okay, everyone, this is pretty much it. Thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure to um, deliver this um, brief presentation. I hope you guys found it useful. So I think we have like eight minutes to um, ask questions. If we can't get to all of your questions this moment, I have a follow-up um, session called Ask Me Anything. If you want to note down the date and time, it's April 10th. Um, it starts at 11.15 a.m. PST for 45 minutes. It's on Product School Slack channel and um, Cassandra can give you guys more information on that too right now. But yeah, so let's get a couple of questions and the rest, please meet me um, in, in a couple of weeks, April 10th for Ask Me Anything session. Awesome, hi, um, thanks so much. It was a really great presentation. We had a lot of comments on that as well. So um, thank you. And um, guys, just make sure you type in your questions in the comments and we'll get to as many as we can right now. I'm going to take a look. Um, I did share the link to his follow-up session, the AMA that's going to take place in our Slack community. So you guys will have all the information there as well. Um, let's see here. Um, okay. Sorry, I saw a couple of questions come through here and um, I'm sure to find them now. Um, one concern about your, um, your suggestion to share a million dollar idea was that if they share this idea with the company, essentially not hire them and potentially take their idea and use it. Um, what, what would you say to, to a question like that? Um, it, it always makes me giggle. Every time I deliver this session, like I, I definitely get this question. So it's a great one, but makes me giggle because listen, we have 75 people working in our product team. They're probably the best of the best in the industry. So first of all, there are very little things that we probably haven't come up with, um, with a group of geniuses that we have in the team. So it's, it's like, it, it's not a, very valid concern. I mean, if also like, like, yes, maybe we take your um, product idea and implement it, but we did not interview you and we did not intend to hire someone for one single idea. Like we, if you have like the an execution often is more imp important than the idea. So if you give us your million dollar idea and we see that, okay, this person is full of creative juices, then we will actually hire you because we don't need one single idea. We need tens of them every single week. Right, exactly. That makes a lot of sense. Um, we had 
quite a few come in. So let me just scroll through and, um, and pick another one. That I'm sure a lot of people usually ask as well. Um, here, this one is from Justin. Um, great advice on the interview. Do you have any advice on getting to the interview in the first place? Um, what, what tips can you share? Getting to the, in getting the interview? Okay. Um, so, hey, Justin, the, the way I understand this question is how to score the interview in the first place. Is that okay? Cool. Um, okay, awesome. So the best way to, there are two ways. Number one is you go through the general pool and you apply on the website or LinkedIn or whatever um, job sites that you're looking for. And when you do that, obviously you have one shot to shine because every morning I come into work and I have 100 resumes on my desk. So how are you going to stand out? So resume becomes really important. And most people scan through your resume and they look for specific things. And it's mostly the impact. If your resume is four pages, it's oftentimes people will just skip it. Similar to if you send me an email that's like one page long, I will refuse to read it. So always stick to one or two pages most. Make sure that for each job, instead of paragraphs, use bullet points and not more than um, five bullet points per job and one or two sentences per bullet point. And do not give me a long laundry list of all the tasks that you accomplished or you did on a day-to-day -day basis. That's not what the resumes are for. Resumes are for you to identify the top three or top five most impactful project that you worked in that job so that you shine through it. And don't just give me the actions that you um, took or what your responsibilities, but the impact of it. So that speaking to the impact will always help you. Um, your intro paragraph is often, I find like 90% of the time they say the same thing, um, data-driven, motivated, self motivated, things like that. So always refrain from those. And for cover letter, um, people have different um, approaches to cover letter. Is it needed? Is it not? I still, um, I'm still a little bit torn about it. But what I know for sure is if you're going to write the cover letter, make sure that it is unique and it's not like every other cover letter that's on Google. So it really needs to be personal, brief, succinct, and a lot of impact in it. So that's if you go through the general set, um, general pool. But a more um, impactful way is actually through connections. So use LinkedIn, use Facebook. Like if I guarantee, like you're wherever you are, if you post to your Facebook to your four thousand friends on Facebook and say, "Hey, do you know someone who knows someone who works at Facebook?" you will know that someone who knows someone who knows someone. So always use your network and make a list of companies that you want to work for. Find people who are working in those companies, in those teams. First, always reach out to them, understand their role, get their tips. And then if you can, submit your resume through an internal employee because um, the internal referrals are almost in every company, at least the ones I worked at, they're prioritized over the general um, submissions. Definitely, I really like the idea of making a list and of course asking for referrals is always pretty powerful. Um, I, we have one more question um, that I wanted to get to and, um, and then after that we'll close out. So this is from Jerry, um, is asking the hire ma hiring manager what uh, their management style is at Passe and would you, would asking like what's the work life balance also something that's not critical to ask? I mean, what what's your input on those two? This is a great question. I actually, when I um, do the longer an hour version of um, this presentation, I actually have time to give some suggestions on the questions to ask. But I'm really glad that Jerry asked this question. So, um, management style not passe. It's it's good. It's it's a valid concern. Like. For example, like what is your management style? How do you, um, how is the team gold? How will my performance um, evaluate it? That's a question actually I ask in every time I interview. I wanna know, I am driven by goals and um, clear expectations and metrics. So it's my right to know like 
how will my performance is going to be evaluated? What is the team um, spirit? What's the team culture? What is the overall company culture? Um, that's great. What is the, um, for example, ooh, I'm, I'm blanking. Oh yeah, so what is your management style? That's really important because your manager is, is manager always plays a key role what for that work-life balance is it's a tricky topic because um it's it may rub people um the wrong way first of all as a theory i don't believe in work-life balance because when you say work-life balance you're talking about two counter forces if you work it sacrifices your personal life and if you do too much stuff personally, you may not get to work. So it's not a balance, it's work-life integration. So it's how to integrate your work and life. Like for example, I will, um, it's 3 p.m. here, I will go get a haircut right now in the middle of my day, but I know that this Sunday, probably in the afternoon, I'll crunch a couple of hours of work to get ready for the week. So um, if you wanna, um, ask about work-life balance, or as I would like to call it as work-life integration, you may, um, un you may want to understand the team dynamics, the overall workload demand, the prioritization, because if your work-life balance sucks, it's probably because of lack of prioritization. So you're better off asking a prioritization um, question instead of that. And last one, which is something that I actually like is, how does my career look at bands in town or like whatever company you're interviewing for? Because you wanna know, yes, you are applying for that product manager role, but you're not gonna die as a product manager. I mean, unless you want to, but like, what is the route? Like, what are the, um, what's the career trajectory? What are the um, growth process for you? How will you evolve in the next five years in that company if you pick that role? So all these questions, I, I think it's um, pretty, pretty good. As long as it's coming from the heart and you're genuinely um, curious about it and it's the most important for you, important thing for you to know, know ask away. Awesome, thank you. And, um, and thanks for your time today and everything. Um, great presentation. We have a ton of questions coming through, but guys, just make sure you click on the link and you can join us in Slack on April 10th. Uh, for his AMA and Slack, so. Um, and can we, um, I'm sure you can um, record those questions, right? Capture them. Sure. So Yeah, so <laughs> in my AMA session, if you come, I'll make sure to um, work with Cassandra, look at all these questions right now, answer them in advance. And if you come to my AMA, I'll make sure to start with those questions and, and, and the answer. So I will make sure that no <laughs> question is unanswered. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and before we let you go, um, and we'll, of course, we'll see you again soon. Um, if, if you have any advice to aspiring product managers out there, we'd love for you to share it. Yeah. So the, I'll just answer the number one question I get. Like it's, I'm not working in a, in a product team right now, but I want to be a product manager how do I do it? Like I'm an engineer, I wanna be a PM. I'm a designer, I wanna be a PM. How do I do it? You, have, you can, by checking three of these, one of these three boxes or all of them. Number one is education. Like if you um, have no product management experience, then you need to fill the gap with education. Product school is a great way for that. I don't want I didn't want to put a shameless plug for that, but it, it is a good way. Or there are other um, courses as well. So fill that gap of education. That's the first box you should check. If um, the second one is experience, I understand that you're a designer, but or you're an engineer, but within your team, there has to be opportunities for you to take on more PM roles. So you can pick one or two projects and go to your PM or go to your tech lead or whoever and be like, hey, like, how would you feel about me owning one of these smaller projects? And um, actually project manage it from start to finish. And this will um, help me get more autonomy and you know, learn on the job as well. So once you 
do maybe like 10, 20 projects like this, you can actually put that on your resume. And when you interview, the interviewer will actually see that you have that PM experience, even though your title doesn't say so. So um, relative experience is the second one. And the third one is um, it's just your enthusiasm and your um, like checking all these five essential rules. Like if you are focused on the impact, at the end of the day, a product manager is a project manager, which the project is the product. So if as long as you're um, skilled in prioritization, you're skilled in um, you know market research, you're skilled in like other areas, all these skills are directly applicable to a PM role. No, absolutely. And that's like amazing advice. So um, thanks for sharing that with everybody. And, um, and thanks again for joining us today. And uh, yeah, thank you. This was, uh, this went by much faster than I thought. And um, I hope I had, we had a little bit more time to answer all the questions, but I'm really glad that we're going to have a follow-up session. Yeah, me too. I think it'll be great. <laughs> awesome. Um, so yeah, if you guys want more information about us too, for those who don't um, aren't familiar, um, you can go to productschool.com and learn more about our courses too. So we'll see you guys uh, next week and uh, we'll see Valentine on April 10th. Thank you again. Cool. Thank you guys. Bye-bye.